Hi, I'm Chicago. I have my own kind of politics, my own kind of music, my sports uh, teams, <clears throat> and when I laugh, <laughs> the whole world grins. I have my own radio station, WGN. We go all day, we go all night. Anytime you want me, just tune in here or give me a call. WGN Radio is Chicago. WGN News is on the air. Here are the late news headlines brought to you by the Chicago Tribune. Vince Lloyd reporting. And now, here at Comiskey Park, the pitchers on the mound, the batters in the box. When you think back to radio during the 1940s, there are certain voices you'll never forget, certain sounds. It's WGN's birthday party rolling right along. Honestly, what's made the biggest impact on me in, in doing this project has been the emails I get from the interviewees the next day or later that day about how happy they were to be back or about how happy they were to be included, but also about how invested they were in it and that they were still sending me stories. They said, I wish I had said this, or if you need another story, here's something you can do. I think for most of us, there's no escape. I mean, I think it sort of gets in your blood and it's, it's there long after you retire or leave. WGN's been around a long, long time, 100 years. They were even around before dramatic radio, even before the golden age of radio. World War I was over, there was a technological breakthrough. Radio had been Morse code, it was used for communication between ships at sea, but now there was the ability to send voice. Herbert Hoover, Secretary of Commerce in 1922, finds infant radio facilitates news gathering. There really wasn't any dramatic radio like the Lone Ranger or, you know, the Shadow. That came later. People just played music and just did routine broadcasting before the innovation started. This new idea came about where you can actually have a sound effects team, music, and acting, literal acting like you would on a stage, and do it in such a way that it would create pictures in your mind. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Marion Claire with a cordial invitation to the Chicago Theater of the Air. Flamand, the most unusual detective in criminal history. Flamand, who looks beyond laughter and tears, jealousy and greed, to discover their basic origins. Hey, things surely are mighty exciting for Annie these days. What's going to happen to her tonight, do you suppose? Wait a minute, Joe. We better do a little less talking and a little more listening. By now, Monty has had time to slip in among those pilots. At the end of the day, it's somebody sitting in front of a microphone, and somehow through magic, it appears at another speaker at another end, and you have that connection to that person. And in the early days of broadcasting, when there were so many things that weren't being done, someone had to come up with the idea or have the courage to face the challenge to do it. May 19th, 1922, you know, thanks to ingenuity and some entrepreneuring young men who said, we're gonna go and do this. Young men described as men of high society. Thorn Donnelly and Elliot Jenkins. Donnelly, who was part of the Donnelly family, publishing family, and Jenkins, who was a uh, member of a, a family of equipment manufacturers. So it was a good partnership, content and equipment. Uh, WDAP was the, uh, the original call letters. And they started in the Wrigley Building. They moved to the Drake Hotel. I think their engineering, their production room was a closet. They had to move to the Drake Hotel because there was some storm damage at the Wrigley Building. Uh, what exactly was the year the WGN moved into the Drake Hotel, Mr. Salinger? 1924. Previous to that, we had a station there with the call letters of WDAP. Uh -huh. And when the Tribune came in, we felt grown up because the handball courts, which had been converted into radio studios <laughs> and which were stifling hot in the summertime, promised to expand into two regular studios. 
so that when we did move upstairs to the uh, two new studios, we all felt as though we had come to age. Colonel McCormick pretty much knew after World War I of the potential of radio. I mean, obviously, he was in the newspaper business. And downstairs, how fast can you handle the paper? Just as fast as the shoots can bring it down. The Chicago Tribune, Colonel McCormick, had been doing some radio work on his own. All right, now, go ahead. He really wanted to get into that business. He had many conversations with his mother about it. He was fascinated by this little box. That, you know, was emanating sounds, and how do I get into this little box? And it was in March of 1924, he said, I'm going to dip my toe in and I'm going to lease the station. And then he finally changed the call letters, and he said, well, I wanted it to reflect the quality of his newspapers. You know what our call letters WGN stand for, don't you? Well, they stand for the world's greatest newspaper, the slogan of our great parent organization, the Chicago Tribune. So that's where WGN Gen comes from, which people don't understand that. Like every call letter in Chicago has a meaning. The call letters came from a boat called the Carl Bradley. Colonel McCormick was able to get the letters from the boat. They, they made a deal somehow and it was back in uh, March 24th of 1924 is when those letters came to us as WGN, the world's greatest newspaper. But also they used WLAB which was the weekly magazine that Tribune Publishing also had. June 1st, 1924, was the first broadcast of This is WGN Radio. This is WGN Chicago, serving the Middle West. And so the if one had to describe the radio broadcast industry in one simple phrase, it would have to be, you've come a long way, baby. WGN was one of the founding members of the mutual broadcasting system and the reason that was formed was really to compete. We've mostly been independent. Early on we had affiliations briefly with CBS and NBC. They had more radio affiliates than even CBS and NBC. It grew to be a very big network. But Mutual was the big one in the 1930s that we were a part of. We were kind of the hub of, you know, because it was WLW in Cincinnati, it was WOR in New York. It was a series of stations together that formed Mutual, so we all took our share in producing some great comedy and some great drama. This was so new, but by the mid to late 1930s, it became a format that every radio network was doing. You know, they were dramatizing mysteries, detectives, comedy shows. A lot of syndicated entertainment programming. It was The Lone Ranger. It was The Adventures of Superman. Eventually, that, you know, kind of went by the wayside and we were live and local. As we do now, we had a lot of national coverage of big events that were happening, whether they were news events, sporting events, we covered them. We were the first station of note to carry what is now the Indianapolis 500. It was then known as the Memorial Day 500. We broadcast the Kentucky Derby. I think this is one of the cool things about this radio station is that it was the first radio station to broadcast a live trial. We were the only radio station to send uh, someone down to Tennessee to, to cover the Scopes monkey trial. 1925, I think it was, Tennessee had declared that you can't teach evolution. It was the law. It was the trial of the century. So we sent Quinn Ryan, our newsman, down to cover it. It was a part of the public service of the Chicago Tribune that we should spend as much as $1,000 a day to broadcast the famous Scopes Evolution Trial, where I went down a week ahead and kind of lined things up, and uh, provide such services as even the Democratic and Republican conventions of 1928, which we broadcast independent of the NBC or CBS network to that extent. There were only three announcers at both conventions, Graham McNamee representing NBC's, through White representing CBS, and myself representing little old WGN. Talk about the remotes that some of these guys have done. WGN has always been a station that has stayed ahead of the curve when it comes to technology and when it comes to innovation. And really because our reach was so deep with 50,000 watts, we could really get the message out there. But I think even though we had some syndicated programming, it was always local. And I think that's what still makes us in AM radio and any radio station very unique. Hello, welcome to the WGN Radio Transmitter site. We're here on Raw Ring Road. <laughs> We're here on Raw Wing Road in Elk Grove Village. 
750 feet, Truscan steel, built in 1939. A lot of people have no idea what it is or what it does. And it's got three guy anchor points, it's got 120 radials. The signal leaves from here, it goes to Hancock, from Hancock it goes to the transmitter site. From that tower, it goes across the country. are wires that are buried in the ground from the center of the tower out 900 feet. They act as the other half of the tower. It puts signal out to the horizon and that signal will go 250 miles along the curvature of the earth but it'll also hit the ionosphere and come back down 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 miles. And we would have people picking us up from Scandinavia late night. People write into us from Finland and Norway. So typically, like March, you know, April, May, I'll get a lot of people sending in notes from Scandinavia, from Sweden, from Norway. This is a letter we got from Sri Lanka, but well, this was a long time ago. <laughs> Saying, hey, we heard you. <laughs> what happens is the BBC turns off for, for like 10 seconds at midnight. And during that little hunk of time, people will listen and say, okay. And it's the wildest thing. I'll forward the, uh, the audio to like David Jennings or whoever's doing overnight news and say, here's your voice. The signal gets out. Uh, and without the tower, um, you know, we're, we'd just be an internet radio station. We've got our networking gear, and uh, we've got a lot of stuff that's old and a lot of stuff that's new. So this is a backup studio we have. So what we do is uh, this board came from Studio A from the first floor when we moved from the first floor to the seventh floor at the Trib Tower. We've got all of the current commercials and everything else in here so we can still continue to broadcast from here if we need to with all of our current material. Here's our transmitter control. So you can see the antenna current meter. These are the transmitters. Main transmitter here. This is a DX50. How, how old do you think this chair is? <laughs> Here's a drawer of meters. And who'd have thought you could find a telephone that doesn't even have a dial on it? <laughs> so are, we, are we ready to do the bomb shelter yet or not? Or should we do? All right, head in. <laughs> if you ever hear uh, Henry Mancini, if you ever hear Henry Mancini on the radio, you know we got we got some problems. Uh, equipment, so. And it's a transcription machine. It burns the grooves into the, into the transcription. Then it, you can play it on a regular turntable. And back in the day, Wally Phillips would have his commercials converted, and then they get played on the air on the turntables. Wally Phillips is my name. I'm with WGN in Chicago. I just wanted to leave a small message that I would be available for the centerfold. Sorry if you had to whip out a flashlight to uh, take the trip through the pump room today, but that's the way it's been. A little dark, dreary skies around here, even inside sometimes, but I'm glad you had a chance to tour our WGN facilities, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you're ever interested in buying the place, let me know. Well, I was there a total of uh, 41 years, but most impressive to our viewers and listeners, probably the 27 years I spent with Wally Phillips, 15 of those as producer for his morning drive time radio program. Wally Phillips was the man. I mean, the ratings that he had, the audience that he had for well over 20 years is legendary. Wally was always one to push limits. He said, we've got to be able to take calls on the air. There's not a lot of guys like him on the planet, and people connected to him. Even though there were phone capabilities, there was no seven second delay to do any editing. There's no panic button that could take uh, something out. He just pushed until we got it. Hello? Rich? How are you, Wally? I'm fine. Thank you for your time. Oh, I, I, kn I know what your day is like, so we won't keep no, you. I'm glad to do it. Well, we appreciate it. Thanks. Hold one second. 
So if you think about the history of our morning show hosts, it was Wally, it was Bob, it was Spike, it was Greg Jarrett, it was John Williams, it was Jonathan Brandmeier, it was Steve Cochran, and by the time we got to Bob, it almost has come full circle because a lot of the things that Bob does on his show is that comfort food that Wally brought to the table as well. Well, you know, it's funny because I first uh, was attracted to Wally as a kid because, a lot, and people don't remember this, he started here, he worked, I think it was like nine to noon or something, and it was not the people helping people do-gooder show. It was Wally making prank phone calls, wacky comedic drop-ins, and, and playing comedy albums, and just, just being pretty nutty. One of Wally's setup calls, a man who said he was with the uh, Newton Unger Technological Society. Nuts. N-U-T-S. This man with uh, the Newton Unger Technological Society had a backpack and it could jet people to work to their office buildings here in Chicago. One of the head people in Tribune Corporation called and said he'd like one. He actually fell for it. I, I used to listen to him and it was, a, it was a lot of fun. And later he became the Wally Phillips that everybody knows and remembers now from the early morning drive show. But you know, the, uh, Wally in the beginning was uh, a much different kind of personality than he ended up being for all those years. Rich? Yes, Wally. Oh, well, I'm glad you're in the shop today. Yes, sir, we're drying off. Boy, you got, really got socked in Elmhurst, didn't you? Well, we sure did, Wally. It's just been uh, terrible all over town. Well, we have two dry, sunny days coming up. That should help, too. Rich, well, our friend Bob Thompson from Grand Rapids is going to the coast on Amtrak. He has a question. Repeat, Bob. All right. Uh, it was a little bit of a daunting experience when Wally said, I want you to be my producer, because there was no producer before me. Marilyn should write the book on how to be a good producer. Yeah. She would almost be doing her own radio show on the other side of the glass, yeah. interviewing the callers, so that by the time that the caller got on the air, Wally knew where you were from, uh, what you did for a living, so Wally could spin off of that and go in whatever direction he, he wanted. He had a to. bio on, on a caller, and if, if you called at 6.30 in the morning and you were a good caller, but we didn't need you right now, you'd be better at 7.45. So she kind of dictated the flow of the show in that respect. So here I am. I don't want to interfere with anything else that's going on. What's my role? How do I work this? And we went from there. We devised, we developed. Uh, we innovated. It was amazing, and we had the good fortune of working with her, yeah. and we both said, oh my gosh, there, there's no one out there like her. Wally had a Saturday morning show, and when we had the Friday night things, he often just stayed overnight so he wouldn't have to rush back in. And he did, and it snowed, and then it snowed, and then he woke up, and it snowed. The windy city of Chicago is white, battered by a furious winter storm which dumped two feet of snow across the Midwest. It reduced Chicago to a toddling town, indeed. I got up the next morning and I said to Esther, well, I'm going to try and make it to the office. So I walked six blocks to the first major bus line, Western Avenue, and I hit a gas station and went into the phone booth and called Wally to tell him what was going on on Western Avenue. And Esther kept track of me because I would call Wally anytime I had an opportunity to give him a report. So she knew where I was. And on top of that, if you called in a report, you got five bucks for it. Nobody else in town could get near a microphone for three days. He was literally radio, period. And that's, that's what really pushed him up over the top. That's when he beat out Miller for the first time. Radio is more than just entertainment. It is service. Our own Wally Phillips puts it best when he says, Doesn't add up right. Radio, R-A-D-I-O, people, P-E-O-P-L-E, -E, that's five and six. And yet radio is people. Radio isn't what it used to be, that nice-looking box over in the corner that edified, intrigued, mystified, and amazed you. Radio is something you cook a steak with on the patio today. You stick in your purse or in your pocket or you punch in the car for information. Radio is your informal friend that gets you through the day and puts you in touch with the world in an instant. Something you flick a button to hear the good news, sometimes bad news. Well, he cared. He was more interested in what listeners wanted than in being great in his own right. He really cared about people. You want to hear a very interesting question that you probably asked yourself within the last few days and didn't get an answer for or don't know the answer for? <laughs> what do you mean by that? Dan, what question answers itself. No, it doesn't. Wait till you hear the question. Dan? Yeah, good afternoon, Wally. Good afternoon. 
I live in a relatively new area. Well, I had the good fortune to work with him because when I first started at the station, I was doing a split shift of traffic as well as working with Steve on the all night show. Before I got the job doing traffic on his show, I had to sit across from him in his office and he quizzed me on street names and intersections. And I thought, I didn't study for this. I started here in uh, 1984 and it was Chuck Swirsky. Chuck set up a, a meeting for me with Dan Fabian, met with Wally Phillips. And so they gave me a one week audition on the air with Wally during the Cubs playoff series with the Padres in 1984. And that was my first exposure to being on air at WGN Radio. Um, that was my dream to be an intern at WGN Radio. I was kind of a geek for the place too. I had two shifts. I was in the community affairs department. So I'd either come in for the morning shift and work the Wally Phillips morning show. Or I'd work the afternoon shift, come in later, but then stay through the end of Bob Collins show. What a tutorial for how to do radio. Got You had about enough of this? Well, sure you have. Look, we know that you know we're trying to sell you something. We also know that you've seen enough of these pitches that no high-tech gimmickry is going to work. So why don't we do this? Let's save us some money and use some time. Just pretend it's one of those fancy promotional bits for radio stations and let your mind exaggerate about WGN a little bit. Don't worry about it. It can't be done. We try it every day. Uh, Wally had just told us, as a matter of fact, that he was going to be pulling the pin soon. He didn't care about all that much for two in the morning wake-ups. So we were looking for somebody capable of doing GN younger. Bob Henley had a gift of picking talent. He'd get in his car one morning, or some mornings, you know, and he'd turn the dial. And on one of those trips, he heard Collins, and that's how he hired Collins. One, two, three. Well, Bob and Wally had a nice relationship. Of course, Bob took over after Wally no longer wanted to do mornings. Bob was a disc jockey by training, but he was a communicator. He was, I don't give a rip what you think. I'm just going to give you my truth. Big personality. And you walked in the studio and you sensed that right away. We're going to laugh about it. It may seem inappropriate to some of you. That's when he first came on this radio station. It's 2 o'clock in Chicago. Hi, I'm Bob Collins. Very unlucky bachelor after last night's date. I don't want to say the girl was ugly, but uh, the maitre d' brought her T-bone in a doggy bag. <laughs> Hello, you old chow hound. He was a guy who I think really loved radio, loved being on the air, loved to have a good time. And I think you got that sense from him. He wasn't as straight laced as a number of the hosts had been over the years. For a good time, call 591-7200 and ask for Bob. I agree with Bob about half the time. Really? That much? But I listen to him all the time. Hey, thanks for turning your knob to Bob. Bob Collins on Radio 720 WGN. Oh, my God. Warren Qualls turning over in his box. I mean, this, this can't be WGN. Uh, good morning, Ron. Hey, how you doing? I'm all right. How are you? Good. I have a question I'd like to... Uh, somebody may have an answer to. If I don't know the answer. I'll be glad to make something up. Well, I, I make them up to my, myself, <laughs> you know. Okay, right. Uh, yeah, Bob was, uh, Bob was GN with a new twist, as in turn was Spike with a new twist on Bob and on down the line. Here's my WGN ID card uh, whisker test. Well, there's a like couple a up there. Nothing there. Yeah, it's Spiker, oh my gosh. He's a man of many talents, you know, from his, his muster to his drawing to his piano playing. He is just a hoot to be with, and um, his favorite saying all the time is, whoopsie. If you didn't like Spike, you didn't like anybody. He was just as warm off the air as he was on. He was... Uh, much deeper than I think a lot of people gave him credit. I always say, you know, I work with so many guys in the morning. They all have big heads. They're all shaped differently. That's my thing. Spike was the only one that did not have a big head. He did not think that way of himself. He just wanted to be your everyday guy. Perhaps the telling difference in Spike O'Dell was he never bought the idea that Spike O'Dell was a big deal. You know, he never got impressed with himself. I would sit next to Tom Peterson in the newsroom, and I was always cracking one-liners off mic, which most people would not appreciate, Tom or Spike. But they both really were enthusiastic about it and let it grow. And from there, I kind of grew into a little bit of a personality on that show. Well, Dennis Rodman has a few problems. You know, let's talk about uh, Mr. Rodman today. Yeah, now there's a headline. Oh, I agree. Well, there's different the, issues here. There's Rodman yeah. who should be suspended for the rest of time. I mean, because they said, go to your room and, and we'll tell you when you can come out, right? 
Well, they said at least 11 grand. Right, and then he has to go through counseling, meet with the commissioner, and then they'll determine if he's eligible and to come back. And when you can act like a young man, then you can come back to our but game. I have a better, a better judgment for Rodman. Take him out to center court and let that guy come just kick him. <laughs> just, just start. Well, Spike is... What can you say about Spike except uh, he and both Bob Collins were smart enough, I think, to just kind of keep the show the same way Wally had it. Wally Phillips, Roy Leonard, um, Bob Collins could not have been, I mean, nothing in common. I don't even know they particularly liked each other. But they were all so authentically themselves, it worked. He sort of like was this gentle, wise voice that came into your kitchen. Well, the record companies are hopping on the jazz bandwagon, and if you tune in your radio, you can hear your favorites in new LPs that are all digitally re-enhanced. Read every book, he went to every play, he saw every movie, he never just sort of did it on the dodge. The playwright knows how to keep your interest with a quip or a startling situation. Santa Claus the movie is a fairly enjoyable bit of holiday entertainment. Tin Man is rated R for language and a couple of sexual situations, but it is an extremely entertaining adult film. There is a variety for the moviegoer this weekend. He was known for being an incredible interviewer. He was so prepared that he didn't need to have a script. I picked up the New York Times, was it last Sunday or the Sunday before, and it was so thrilling to see on one side of the open page a half-page ad for the Steppenwolf Theater production of oh, Grapes yeah. of Wrath on Broadway. Roy Leonard with Paul McCartney for Rocker. Roy seemed like this really nice person on the air. He really was, and you know, it showed. I don't think I ever, ever, ever heard Roy get angry. Even his manner of speaking was the same. You know, I mean, he was just genuinely curious about people. He leaned into conversations. I don't know whether you folks lucked out or whether you, uh, maybe you talked with Nancy Reagan's astrologer or something. <laughs> <laughs> he would just be chatting away about something, and you know, it dawned on me later that that's a gift. I spent, you know, many Saturdays with him and he was always so kind to me and he said, you know, if you're honest with the audience and you endear yourself to them, you'll be here forever. And I will always contend that it's not our station, it's theirs, and we're just, you know, sitting in the seat for a while. Oh, by the way, this is the Mr. Fix-It Show, sponsored, uh, this hour of the Mr. Fix-It Show is sponsored by Ace Hardware. So I was a home builder, and I wrote a bunch of radio stations with this idea of a home improvement radio show. And I thought for sure it was going to be on public radio, but it was WGN Radio that actually responded. As I'm walking into the studio, first time I've ever been on the radio, you know, walking in, there's Bob Collins, you know, this legend. And he goes, what are we going to call you? And I said, well, my name's Lou Manfredini. No, no, no. And then Ann just goes, let's call him Mr. Fix-It. And then I sat down, and that's how it started. What makes it special is we're family. Aww. Aww. Yeah, it's nice. 720 AM WGN Radio is Chicago. Collins used to sort of unwind by grabbing a big orange and coming into my office for 10 minutes after the show. One morning he got to laughing so hard about something that he spilled the big orange on this god-awful couch somebody had bequeathed to my office. Suddenly, a card-carrying mogul, I mean, a, as big as they come in the business, walks in. He sits down and says, if you two don't know who I am, you shouldn't be in this business. To which Collins responded, we know who you are. You're the guy sitting in the orange pot. <laughs> No, if you got to make a choice, say. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I ran a, a piece of sound from uh, Kevin O'Neill, who was the Northwestern basketball coach at the time, and he, he was talking about somebody having <laughs> the kahunas to do that in the game. I mean, we're going we're gonna to have a good basketball program. I don't know when the hell it's going to be, but I can assure you we're going to have a good... If we got four more guys of Wings caliber with Wings kahunas, we're going to have a chance to win. And so Bob stopped me. He said, we need to hear that again. What did he just say? I then had to go into a 60-second live commercial read, and Bob was falling on the floor. I like them kahunas. <laughs> We're gearing up. I didn't say it. The coach said it. <laughs> that may be the funniest tape I've ever heard. <laughs> <clears throat> it's okay. Sorry. America's about choices. Wait, wait, wait. Yes. I, I just, I got to hear it one more time. Down the line, we're going to... I mean, we're going we're gonna to have a good basketball program. I don't know when the hell it's going to be, but I can assure you we're going to have a good... If we got four more guys of Wings caliber with Wings kahunas, <laughs> we're going to have a chance to win. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Bob? That's what I think he... Where'd he go? He used the wrong... He's <laughs> under the <laughs> table. <laughs> yeah, you got a couple of them Hawaiian cats out of here, man. I, I think he was confusing two languages there. <laughs> He, he meant to use neither, a Spanish of, neither of which was English. but either one was, was good. Oh, God. And he kept stopping me and replaying the audio. And he would do things like that. And when he got laughing, it was contagious, and everybody else in the studio would end up laughing right along with him. What it did for me was it kind of brought me out of my comfort zone a little bit because I was always pretty buttoned up when I was on the air. Dave Bennett, WGN Sports. Okay, Dave. Yeah, you know, they didn't ask this in Sports Illustrated this no, month. No, no. What do you think the average guy would say? The average guy. When, the first thing I'd like to do when I get home is make love. Eat, Eat or, or go to sleep. I'd say A would be the answer. Make okay. love. Okay. That's the average guy. The average guy. Steve, what do you think the average guy would say? Um, A. What were the percentages on on making love first thing? Percentages were women, 52%, guys, 71 Ah, okay. There. Half of the women and three quarters of the men said first thing when they come home. If they got no, their way. No, no, it'd be over half of the women and under three quarters of the men. Yeah, 2% okay. over and under. <laughs> well, I mean, if you're going to skew it, I'll skew okay, it. Okay, so fine. And then the next question, Steve, is over or under. <laughs> <laughs> Was that in the survey? No, it's our survey. Okay, Dave, do you want to go? Uh, yeah, I okay. think it's time. Okay. One of, the, one of the real negatives that we had at the time was we didn't have any females on the air. We're Kathy and Judy on Radio 720. What's our station? WGN, that's what you're listening to. Kathy and Judy were unique in that it was two women doing a major daytime show. That didn't happen much 20 years ago. It doesn't happen much today. It should happen more often. Well, it's two women. Two women, you know, I mean, girl power. They were just natural. They weren't pretentious. They would say things and do things that men couldn't believe they were saying, and then they couldn't wait to hear what was next. Sex Thursday. <laughs> Concubitis, Latin for lying together. For Nero, there was nothing like a little fiddling and concubitis to make it a great night. They brought everything about women and older women to the center, you know, where you could just bring out any subject that were like taboo on some of the programs. They didn't care. They would say before the segment started, okay, Turn the radio off if you have children who don't want to hear us talk about sex, which was a good way of saying, turn the radio up, we're going to talk about sex. I would cower on sex Thursdays. I'm like, I don't want to talk about anything about this, so I would like hide under my desk or whatever. But they just, they brought so much fun. My relationship with Kathy and Judy was probably among the most honest relationships I've ever had in my life. They were my second and third wife. I, I keep using the word generous, but they let me sort of spread my wings on that show. Kathy and Judy are must-hear radio, especially for guys. With the way Steve Bertrand stands up to them. This is Steve. And he's standing up. Steve will say, now that's not what you said last week. They're not very consistent. Yes, we are. No, we're not. Kathy and Judy on Radio 720 WGN. There would be times where I'd disagree with them and they'd just say, oh, shut up, Steve. And then they would encourage listeners. The listeners would call and they'd say, shut up, Steve. Bertrand from Berwyn is nodding his head. Yes, Are you he from Berwyn? have a date to go do this. We're going to go to Zydeco. He's eight feet tall and so you're what? Oh, <laughs> this, I Wait. want pictures of this. Wait, does that bother you, Steve, to Zydeco with a short girl? You can just Take rest the pen your out of your mouth. mouth. Not a bit. Okay, not okay. a bit. We had a manager that was new to the radio station, and he didn't know the room, <laughs> or he should have. But I remember he went into their office and sat on their sofa, and he said, okay, so, you know, what are we going to do? What, what do we need to do to, you know, make Kathy and Judy like they weren't already pretty good? And Kathy said, well, you should leave us alone. I wasn't in the room, but I've heard that story, and I 100% believe it, because that's what they were like. They had so much confidence. I mean, there were times when we were on the air talking about things, and we were arguing. I mean, it was, we were fighting, <laughs> and it was all great. I mean, it was, you know, we, could, we got over it quickly, but it, it was a very honest radio show. Kathy and Judy, I did their um, conventions, the Kathy and Judy conventions. All right. We are ready to begin the Camp Kathy and Judy Friday Night Talent Show. And our judges, of course, would be none other than our cherished office husband, 
Steve Bertrand and both his knees. I traveled with the Bears in the late 80s, so when they were still the rock star sort of bears. Nothing compared to the Kathy and Judy convention. There were 1,800 ladies that came, their girlfriends. We had sponsors uh, partake in them, and anything from a Botox doctor being there to maybe a um, little craft thing or whatever, whatever. I mean, the girls, they loved it. And I'm not kidding you, we would walk through the crowd in the ballroom. By the time we got to the other side, we could not see because of all the flash bulbs that had been going up. It was unbelievable. Radio 720, WG in Chicago. Time for the Kathy and Judy show. I saw something in Red Book Magazine. One this, of my favorites. Uh, yes, right. Yeah. It's uh, guys confess the sexiest gift she ever gave me. And one guy says, she arranged a three-day trip to a beautiful bed and breakfast. And I'm thinking... <laughs> I don't think that most guys think bed and breakfasts are all that cool. I depends. Hate, I hate <laughs> Actually, I have depends a on how much time you spend up. at breakfast. Yeah, I suppose. I have uh. a great <laughs> survey on that coming up. What would you rather home? What go home? What would you rather do first? Sleep, have sex, or eat food? There's a gender difference. Well, it depends on what's on TV, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and whether the lazy boy's in the shop. <laughs> All, All right. right. More important issues to be raised on the Kathy and Judy show right now. It's 9 o'clock. I was doing the midday show. I had gotten home late afternoon. Brenda said, did you hear the news? There's a... God. The Cessna was supposed to make a right-hand turn and get at least a quarter of a mile behind Collins. Mm. Radio transmissions show Collins was advised of the Cessna in the area. At 8.30, we would have Paul Harvey, and Orion would be in the studio right around then. He used to go flying with Bob fairly often. I remember Bob looking out the windows of the Studio A in Tribune Tower. He would open the blinds because the sun was getting ready to, to, to come up, and Bob said, wow, it's going to be a great day to fly. Big O, you want to come? And Orion, as always, was booked <laughs> from morning to night, right? And he didn't have time. And I didn't think much more about it. We then did our crossover with him, and we left the station. He says he sees it, but he may have actually seen a different plane. Moments later, someone, possibly Collins, says, just had a midair. Seconds later, another transmission. Planes going down two miles west of power plant. I uh, was kind of in a mental and emotional denial of it for a while. I driving back to the radio station, listening and thinking, uh, they're going to find the plane or they're going to find Bob. This is not going to be what this is, and it was. I got into the newsroom, and I mean, it was clear instantly. It, it hadn't occurred to me that it might have been Bob. David Kaplan called me and said, you know what's going on? I said, as soon as he called, I knew what was happening. Oh my gosh, this can't be, but then it is. And I had admiration for the way on-air people handled it. There wasn't any formal acknowledgement of that because everybody wanted to make sure that Bob Collins' wife, Christine, knew. knew what was going on before anything was said on the air. I think the whole city went along with that. Everybody in media went along with that because the word got out, no one has talked to her. She cannot learn this listening to the radio. Larry Schreiner went out to uh, Christine to make sure somebody she knew was with her before you know she might have heard about it elsewhere. We all knew in the radio station hours before it was ever announced. One of my jobs that day was to record the obituaries. And so then at six o'clock in the newscast when the Lake County Coroner Barbara Richardson was on with David Stewart, my obituary is ready to go. Uh, our main purpose uh, and focus right now was to try to identify the, the victims that were at the, ho the hospital, uh, the plane that was, was at the hospital. And we have, we have made identification. Oh, dear. It's difficult. Uh, it's difficult for all of us, Barb. It's terrible. Uh, we do have personal effects belonging to Bob Collins and to the uh, passenger that was with him. Are you there? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. We're just uh, trying to catch our breath here. Um, so that uh, that uh, that is uh, what we can consider official confirmation yes, of what we've been I, afraid I'm, for I'm so sure, long. I'm uh, sure it's no doubt about who he is, none whatsoever. Barb, this this is Spike. Uh, uh, Hi. Um, any other uh, identifications? I was just viewing uh, 
viewing Bob. There wasn't any doubt about who it was. Okay. It's a tough job. Thank you, Barb. All right. I'm, I'm sorry. Bob Collins. <sighs> Longtime morning man. Uh, big kahuna here at WGN Radio. A victim of a plane crash this afternoon. We went into the radio station about six or seven in the evening, as did just about everybody else from the station because we wanted to be with our radio family during this trauma. That night, anyone that was off shift, they all came back, so we were all there together to console each other. Kathy and Judy, they stopped at a restaurant and brought food in for everyone. Going on the air that night was one of the hardest shows we've ever done. It was like 9-11. When they brought in the morning papers, and Bob's picture was on, on the front of the paper. And the crash plane on top of a, the hospital was right there. And we'd been talking about it all night long, and we'd all been commiserating, we'd all been mourning together. But then when I opened up the paper, that was it. I'd, I'd had it at that point. For the 600,000 people who regularly wake up to Bob Collins in the morning, there was an incomparable void that only a sudden death can bring. But as WGN's Joni Lum reports, there were bright spots, thanks to those who knew him best, manning the microphones and the memories. I think the hardest thing was what we were gonna do the next morning. I didn't know who was gonna be there, and then they told me, Spike will be here, just come in normal. And we're like, what are we gonna do? We still gotta come in and do a show. Spike was unbelievable, it's been well documented. I mean, I don't know how he kept it together. And Spike said, I, I don't know what to do today, you guys. Um, I'm just going to say whatever comes to my head. I'm going to wing it, and please help me. And that was how we got through that first day. WGN Spike Odell stepped into big shoes, guiding radio listeners through an emotional morning, a Bob Collins show without Bob Collins. Just after 6. This is the Bob Collins Show, Radio 720, WGN Chicago. A tough morning. I remember that laugh. I can hear that, yeah. that ribald kind of laugh, that cackle of his so well because I said to him, he walked in one day and he said, how do you like my beard? I said, I like it on you. I certainly wouldn't want it on me. <laughs> and he laughed and I thought, gee, this, this, I like his sense of humor. Diane Husky was Colin's assistant for 15 years. My boss has told me, my immediate boss has told me to... Uh, Stay home, you know. I, yeah, I. This is WGN. Is if you, if you've never worked here, you don't understand it. It really is. This radio station is a family, and he felt it. I mean, he was here for over 25 years. It's where you always need somebody like Kathy and Judy. There were moments where you needed somebody to break the ice to finally say, "Okay, we're going to stop doing that." and we're gonna start doing this, and it's gonna be okay now. We're, we're, we're gonna move forward. Welcome to Bob Collins' office. It's a lot like him. Gruff on the outside, warm and friendly on the inside, decorated with pictures of people he loved and admired, left untouched with the radio tuned to 720 and his chair empty. That's so to be done with care. I don't wanna waste it. <laughs> so when Spike moved into Bob's office, there wasn't anything in the cabinets, really, but there was this bottle of Jack Daniels that had been opened and partially consumed. There it is, the My original bottle. Did you bottle. say it was the only thing in his desk, Dave? <laughs> is that right? That, that's what I've been told. <laughs> that's legend. Spike, is that true? Well, first of all, hello, kids. How's everybody today? <laughs> Good to hear you. I don't know who decided this, that we would keep that, and on Bob's birthday, we would drink a toast to him. My first words about Uncle Bobby before I got to meet him and talk to him, that uh, we will get together and watch the world go by, but uh, I'm not ready yet, so Uncle Bobby, uh, you'll have to do it alone until I get there. And Uncle Bobby, we miss you. Here, here. Yeah. All right. Drink up, everybody. Cheers. Wherever you are. Happy birthday. You know, what I take away from talking to these people is the similarities in many of their answers. You know, how many times did the word family come up? There was an immense amount of talent in front of the mic and behind the mic that really set the tone for what it is today. It has a long history. It's pretty much the same station, just has changed with the times. But that family feeling came through the speakers. Yeah. There's a sense of ownership, and yet there's a sense of gratitude to be part of it. Sort of the monolith, the legendary radio station, 
Whenever I say WGN, even if I'm in California or New York, people know WGN Radio. There is a relationship with WGN Radio listeners unlike any radio station Absolutely. That, uh, that I'm aware of. Literally was part of the community. It is today. It has nothing to do with the people standing on the microphone. It's our audience. We're not copying airs. We're not fast-talking music DJs. For people having a conversation with you. We just rally around people, you know, and it's, we always know that we can count on the WGN family. There's a real power and magic for us as a station to be known as that. That formula is what has made us successful and I think what will continue to make us successful for a hundred years. And I think it will be part of that fabric for a very long time.